Um, so in this lecture, uh, we will maybe do a little bit more with the framework, but I also want to spend more time when you ask questions. We've gone to uh, four lectures, five lectures, four lectures already. We've got two more to go today, right? Mm, one more. Here. One more to go. So this is the fifth lecture, a uh, si sixth lecture. Okay. So we've gone to five. I I I have trouble counting because I don't use my uh, second system too often. Um, okay. So. If you have any questions to ask, this, this now is a good time to ask them. But any part, yes. Well, when you had been, um, when you had talked about Yuri Geller uh, being confirmed as a psychic, uh, you cited two specifics, uh, the dice box and the uh, grapes. Uh, I know of various... Okay, uh, how, so how do you that? Fool? Okay, so you, you're, the, the question being asked me uh, by this gentleman is that, uh, I mentioned uh, Uri Geller's the experiments at SRI, Stanford Research Institute, on Uri Geller, where they were designed to test his uh, metal bending powers, the psychic power, uh, parent, psychokinetic powers, and they, they failed, they couldn't get any evidence for that. But in between, they did some what they called informal experiments to make the relief the stress. Geller apparently suggested some of these experiments, and one of them was a dye box experiment, where a dye uh, was put in a file box and, and uh, shaken, and then uh, placed down, and Geller would write down on a piece of paper or card what the value of the dye was that was up and was face up uh, when they would open the box, so it one to six. And he was right, and they did it ten, ten times, they did try, ten trials, and um, he was right on eight, and he passed on the other two. So the, the statistics, this is a very significant, highly significant thing. Um, the other thing I, uh, that was being asked about was that another experiment they did where they said they confirmed his psychic powers was a uh, drawing duplication. He was put in a Faraday cage, which is a cage that supposedly shields out all kinds of electronic uh, radiation. And outside the cage, the experiment is actually, they didn't use a real good randomizing device. It was, it was, a, it was a, a, a experiment. They do this as a real parapsychological experiment. They would use the best randomizing procedures possible. They simply took a dictionary and just opened up a, 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 man, a quasi random and uh, looked at the first word that interested him and then used that to draw a picture of some sort. And um, he got amazing uh, hits. And when the best hit, which is a bunch of grapes, was drawn, it was a drawing. The other drawing was a bunch of grapes and I think the number of grapes in each drawing is identical almost. Very striking type of hit. And now, now the question was, how did Geller do this? What's going on here? Well, uh, remember the dog uh, that barked in the night, that didn't bark in the night? Well, no, it's never been mentioned ever by the, in the experiments or, uh, or ever that Geller is always accompanied by his brother-in-law, Shippy Strain, and Shippy's always in the background. And uh, when he's on a stage, even when in Orlando, Florida, where Geller was at the Magic Convention that both DJ and I attended in October, Geller was the invited speaker to a group of magicians. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a very controversial to have him there. But Geller uh, did perform some things on stage. He performed uh, his standard thing where he has a volunteer from the audience come up and ask her name any color, a primary color. And to write it down, he turns his back, and Moses has, covers his eyes like this, he turns his back, so he obviously can't see what she's writing, and she prints down a color, which she printed orange. And uh, he's supposed to try and now psychically discern what she wrote, and he couldn't get it, so he gave up on that. Then he looked and saw it was orange, he says, no, I said primary color. 
<laughs> and that's because uh, Shippy, who sits in the audience and signals him, can only has can only signal a, a few small number. That got me red, black, yeah, you know, one of the crazy colors. Red, orange, red, green, blue, yellow. Oh, yeah. And so uh, she did it again, and this time you got it right. Uh, and I didn't know Shippy was there. I thought, I thought they just brought the other over there. But, but Shippy, you know, that goes anywhere without Shippy. I should have realized it. And immediately I said, Shippy's got to be in the audience. And it was. Because <laughs> as Geller was about to go home, back to the airport uh, later on in, in the uh, magic meeting, uh, Geller came up to me and asked if he could have his picture taken with him. And he gave the camera to his brother and introduced him to Shippy. And, um, and but Chippy's always there, he's always around, and he's in the background. Chippy is, without Chippy, Geller couldn't do a lot of things. Now, how did he duplicate the, 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 some of these drawings? Well, Chippy's walk, walking around that place, all along, he's outside the cage and stuff like that, and he has a way of signaling Geller in there. We don't know exactly all the details. Mm -hmm. I think if you read Manny's book, he gives uh, his best guess as to what's happening there. It certainly wasn't impressive because you have this guy Shippy Strang around and he never mentioned it. Okay, now let's get to the die in the box. My, Martin Gardner was very much interested in this particular one because uh, Houdini had studied a uh, Spanish uh, psychic, came to this country and gave a big reputation, who supposedly had x ray eyes. And one of the things the Spanish uh, man, Armacillus, I can't pronounce his name, I can't get it exactly, but anyways, what this guy was, one of his x-ray eye demonstrations was to take a file box, just like when he was at SRI, a file box, regular file box, you know, that holds file cards, and he'd have someone put something in that file box, and he'd hold it, of course, and he could manipulate that file box so that he turned it around, and he could, this was the sun, he could open, no one else could see it, so he could open just enough, just a little crack, you get it to the thing right here, you can see what's in the box. That's what he did. He did, he did, he did he demonstrated and proved it to him. In fact, he got this guy to confess because he was kind of right to nail it. Um, so when Mark Gardner heard that they did this thing with the Fonda box, the question was, did Geller ever get his hands on it? How did he do that experiment? So when I was at SRI, I tried to, I mean, after, I, after SRI, I met, I met the dark card crew another time. A couple of times I met with them. Each time I tried to get them to tell me exactly how they did that experiment. Well, the first thing I learned was that it wasn't a formal experiment. He admitted that it wasn't part of the formal experiments. They were, all their formal experiments were just with metal and they had everything set up. These were just more of the crumple things to, to they, 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 they did them in between trials when it was getting too tense and nothing happening with the videotapes and stuff like that. So they would take a break. And during the break, one of the things they did to relax, and they said Geller suggested that, to let's put a box, a die in a box and shake it out. Because they did it at odd times. And it uh, wasn't the plan. And I said, the important thing was that Geller had to get his hands on the box. And they uniformly always told him no. He never did. I mean, they didn't never said no, I'm sorry. They never told him no. They said, only the experimenters were allowed to hold the box, touch the box. Later, I discovered that they considered Geller as one of the experimenters. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, I don't know what to say <laughs> But, to my, my way of looking at it though, it's, not, it's, it's a non-issue because since this wasn't a pre-planned experiment, right. it was suggested by Geller, and they don't have other good records and other books. But when, when they had nothing after all their work trying to pin down metal bending and they didn't, they didn't get any evidence for that at all, they fell back on this and they finally retrospect made what I call a retrospective experiment. So they had something right up. And they got it published in Nature Ball Place, of course. That was very controversial there. Uh, because I was one of the referees. And I, as far as I know, all the referees said, no, we don't, we don't think it's, this is a publishable paper. The editor overruled us and published it anyway. And his excuse they had to come the editorial. He said, 
this has been around so long, you know, the rumors has been going on about what actually is in this paper. We decided we would publish it yes, as is, even though it's, the referees said, rejected it. Uh, because we want to dispel all the rumors so people can see actually what was there. And they thought that was good enough to show that there was nothing, which is unusual to publish a paper where they all know ahead of time. All the referees said, no, it's, it's not worth publishing. Uh, <clears throat> That's a strange thing to go on. Anyway, so that's, I hope that tells you that. The problem is, that the point is that there's never been any planned experiment, that we would call it an experiment, or testing, which I don't see testing as experiments, but, but anyways, that's ever showed that Gallo could do anything. We're going to, in the um, last, uh, next to the last lecture, I'm going to uh, go through some other uh, experiments with Gallo done by some other group of scientists in England. And I'll get, let you decide for yourself. Because these, these uh, very prominent uh, uh, physicists uh, will, uh, well, we'll see. You'll see when, when we get to it. I, I plan to do this in lecture nine, which is tomorrow, I guess. Yeah. Uh, OK, any other questions that people have? It was a good question. Thank you. And I talked a lot. That's fine. I'm, <laughs> I, I like to talk. <laughs> uh, OK, any other questions? Wendy. Uh, okay. The, um, in the sample case to the 1944, um, I guess the high school, the girls' school, um, and the psychic, they, the, um, now, you, can, you're talking about case number two. Someone left their course guide up here. Let me see. So, so I can, I look. That was the Kiter study. And the, and, um, and the, what page, what page are you talking about, Wendy? Okay. It's, it's the course guide. The Kreider study. Yeah, the the oh, the Kreider. What are we talking about? Okay, fine. Okay. Um, what? 12. Page 12. Yeah, course guide. Yeah, sample 12. case two is Kreider, right. right. Okay. And so on the 25 items, I was looking at that. And I was thinking, well, that's just cold reading. And so. So, yeah, so thinking, Wendy is saying that she's looked at all these 25 items and she says that's just cold reading. It's, it's not cold. Good cold reading. It's just uh, <laughs> it's really just call them uh, they they they're standard stock type of spiels. The two kinds of uh, statements you can make, uh, two th three four things you can make about statements. They can be positive or negative. They can be so general that they apply to everyone, mm -hmm. or they can be rather specific. Okay. Um, I did an experiment many years ago. In fact, it was the basis of a, my first paper on cold reading, uh, many years when I was at Harvard, my first position there. And um, we did the experiment. What, what we did was I was interested in the fact that a lot of personality tests, when they make these personality tests, you know, the Minnesota multiphasic and these personality tests where you, you have to ask questions, do you foam with the mouth when you brush your teeth, that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, they do, they do, they work hard. They make item analyses. and. They try to throw out statements where everyone says the same thing, accepts them, because they don't discriminate. You want questions that are discriminating. Uh, so those general statements, which everyone accepts as true of themselves, you don't want in a personality test, because it's not going to distinguish that person from this other person. You want to have statements that are specific. And the way you find that out is they simply give a preliminary test to lots of people, and if they find that 80 percent answer this question uh, yes, then they throw that out. They want questions where, where, which are more like 50 percent will answer yes. And, and, you know. So I try to do this, but with we're doing it in the cold reading context. Uh, I tried to. I found. I, I took the questions that they toss out. So I took questions from personality tests that were thrown out. The 90 percent of what people accept is true of themselves. And I took both positive and negative ones. But also, uh, uh, and what I found was this. I tried to, I found the formula, uh, recipe, so that you can give people a statement, a set, set of statements that they will accept as true themselves. We found if we give everyone statements that are all positive, even though that everyone accepts, it's not too plausible for people. They, they, they don't buy into it that much. They don't accept it as, as valid. It's because they say it's all positive, you know. Uh, you know, I'm not that good. Uh, so, but then we found that, uh, oh, the other thing I should mention, 
I was getting questions that are general, that everyone accepts true of themselves and that are positive. And I'm also getting questions that are negative, but everyone accepts it's true of themselves as well as other people. And then I got questions that uh, people, most people accept as true of themselves, but, uh, but they don't like them. They don't think of them as good. They're negative. And I got, and what the formula was, was that I, when I put together about 75% of the statements are general statements that everyone accepts as true of themselves, but are positive. And I had 25% of the statements that are negative, but which everyone sees as not only true of themselves, but of everyone else. So I, they share that negative thing with everyone else. That's more acceptable to them. But it makes it plausible too, because it's not all positive. We found that that works like a charm. If you're going to be a, a good psych, you want to just have a, statement, a set of statements, you can give to someone and say, look, this is true of you, isn't it? They will accept that. That was the recipe. So you have negative things, because that makes it plausible, because you, no one's, no, no one, everyone knows that if, you, if someone tells you everything is positive, they, they know that's probably not, 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 not believable. So you give them negative statements that they can accept because everyone else has the same problem. Okay? And, uh, and then you give them a lot of positive statements they think are unique, but, but everyone accepts it's true of themselves, but they don't realize that. But a positive, that is the ideal thing. So this thing, though, is um, really even goes beyond that in one sense. I took, when I saw this first thing when I was at, Har I was at Harvard when I first read this, I found this paper by Kreider. I took these statements and I went to, um, because they're aimed at girls, females, and at, at that time in the, uh, this was 50s, at Harvard, um, most of the, all the secretaries were female and there were very few female faculty, in fact there were none. Uh, they, there was a female faculty, though, for the girls, and that was at F Radcliffe, they called it at that time. And Radcliffe was a separate college, but the girls now, as a result of World War II at Harvard, they took the same classes with the boys. But, they, uh, uh, but the faculty, that they got the degree at Radcliffe, and then later it, it became a Harvard degree. So now the girls and boys get the Harvard degrees, and they go to Harvard. But at that time, even though you got a degree at Harvard, basically you, weren't, you didn't get a Harvard degree, you got a degree at Radcliffe if you were a female. And it was like that. But anyway, at that time, I went around, I want to just want to justify this, I went around and I went to every female secretary I could find on the campus. I, took, I gave you two readings. I said, I want you, I didn't say anything about it, I said, would you check each of these items that's true of you? And of course, almost 96 to 98% take them as true of themselves. So it was, it was quite a simple thing to do, but it was, it was quite blatant. And, and you can see why. This one's quite obvious. You look at it and you see the general good health, but kidneys normal and uh, uh, toenails are normal. Uh, uh, you don't have any uh, senility, you know, that kind of stuff. Obviously, this stuff is done in Lake Wokegon. You're right. Exactly, exactly. So she said, Okay, so the question was that they're all Lake, Lake Wobegon. You could call it the Lake Wobegon uh, uh, reading, okay. Uh, but also, the other thing you know is that it, it's almost certainly that these girls going to college at that time in the 1940s, uh, they were coming from very upper class families, which means that they probably are, would be much likely to be more healthier than, than, than normal, even. So uh, that even applies to you more. So that almost certainly they're going to have normal kidneys and two legs and two arms and fingers and that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so you have anything else, Wendy? Is that? Well, I was just going to say that the, that the psychologist who was um, evaluating the margarita, who, who was the um, character analyst, um, they said, where was it? Um, psychologist Kreider stated that psychologists may say that the statements are mostly complimentary, that they are, are too general, and that they will apply to anyone. However, from what I knew of the students, I was in substantial agreement with the analyses as presented. When was when was cold reading figured out? Okay, you, uh, the, the question was asked. Uh, she's saying that. Uh, Kreider, to her, she's quite amazed, uh, the questioner here in the audience, she seems to be quite amazed that uh, Kreider himself, the psychologist, didn't recognize this is just general, 
This we wouldn't call us a cold reading. We call us uh, a stock spiel type of thing. Okay. okay. Uh, cold reading is a little more sophisticated. Okay. Uh, and uh, but these are generalities. These are what we would call today forest statements, a Barnum statements. They call them. That's the other word. Barnum said that you got to give something for everyone and something like that. You know, uh, have a, every thing, you, every show he does, you got to have a little bit of something for everyone. And so they, these are we call these Barnum statements out in the literature. Um, and how come Crider didn't know about this kind of stuff? Well, uh, the, the, first of all, the cold, term cold reading, this was written, paper was published in 1944. Max Maven, the mentalist, mm. and I both got intrigued by, uh, we had a discussion and, and then began doing, tried to do some research. When was the term cold reading first come into play? We could not find any example of cold reading used to discuss, describe a psychic reading of the, of the, of the kind we, we now apply cold reading to. We couldn't find any use of the term cold reading before the word 1944, I think. Uh, and, um, and the reason for that, but there were people who were aware, Houdini and other people, that there were psychic readings which uh, were consist of generalities and people could uh, you know, uh, use all kinds of ways of convincing you that it was real even though it's not. But they didn't use the words cold reading. And the cold, if you look in the web today for cold reading, you still get most of the hits are gonna be on cold reading that applies to what goes on when you audition for a play. You're given a script and they call it a cold reading. That goes way back. And so at some point, and the first person who used the term cold reading to apply to what we call psych reading, and, to, and, to, and in the sense we use it now, was um, William Gresham, who uh, wrote Nightmare Alley, in, uh, in a, that, a began, which is a good book, but became a movie, a very little great, uh, great B, C movie with Tyrone Power in it. But in that movie, Tyrone Power gives a cold reading, a very good cold reading, to a sheriff, and he convinces the sheriff that, uh, that he should leave their, their uh, carnival alone or something like that. So, uh, but, but it was the first, that's the first use we can have of it. And then the second use of cold reading was also by William Gresham in a book he did called Monster Midway, which is a nonfiction book in which he, he describes what goes on in the carnival, different things. And he has a chapter on, what, on the mid camp. That's what the, in the carnival they call palm readers. And uh, he uses, he gives techniques for how to do cold reading on it. And he calls that cold reading too. And that's the first we can find. As far as we know, that's what started the, using cold reading to apply to uh, psychic readings where you, you see the person cold. And we, we we're guessing, the best guess is that it was borrowed from the cold reading that people would on audition, maybe. But it caught on, and uh, so today it's a big thing. But it never was used, as far as we can tell, until 1944. At just about the time that Crider wrote this paper. So he wouldn't have known about cold reading as such. He might have known about, uh, from, if he had done his reading, he might have known about some uh, skeptics. Because uh, as a kid, I used to read books by some skeptics in the library, I remember, uh, where they, that's how I first learned that they, were, they call it glittering gener generalities, that, that people use, psychics use, and other people use glitter, glittering gener generalities, is the term they use. For, you, you make these general statements that could apply to anyone. And um, uh, so he could have learned about that, but it was but, but much more likely that he'd hear about it later. But again, psychologists, people went to college didn't learn about these things. They were, they, they're, the nice thing about going to college or being a professor is that you're immunized from the outside world. And uh, you don't have street smarts, as we call it. So, so you can be taken in by, by things. So, but fortunately, most of them stay within that uh, framework uh, within that domain of the college and they interact with one another and they don't get off the campus at all and so they're protected by that. So, uh, but they don't have street smarts usually. And uh, so Crider probably, even though he has training as a psychologist, you know what kind of training it was, he probably didn't have any street smarts. And uh, that's, that's true of scientists and other people and that's one example, one reason why you can find that smart people like scientists and professors and so on can be taken in. And um, did I answer your question? I, I, Pretty much it led to about a billion I, more, but I'm, I'm okay, I, I was, but, but I did something else that, um, uh, probably did something else that um, uh, Danny Kahneman talks about as um, attribute, 
substitution. He uses in the term of that you get a tough problem, you solve another problem that's left that you can solve. <laughs> so you asked me a question, but I, asked, I answered, I gave an answer that I was good at answering, and, and uh, it sidestepped maybe what you really wanted to know. But All right, so I'll, then, I'll, then I'll bring up the other one. Okay. Which is, my understanding of cold reading is that people remember the hits and forget the misses. And so, if this was all of the okay, well, well, let's because no, the, no, the, the audience uh, watching us on the TV well, don't hear your what you're saying, so I just got to rephrase it. Okay. So you're you're saying that the audience that they, well, as you understand cold reading, people remember the hits and forget the and, and don't 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 and forget the misses. Well, in this case, they were asked to evaluate each one, so I think that this wasn't a memory thing. Yeah. Okay, so that was different. Yeah, okay, it, but it's, it's a part of it, and this is what subjective validation is that people do. It's a kind of cherry picking too. You do focus on uh, what is consistent in, in, in the story and, and that meets with what you know and everything else becomes a background and, and eventually you begin to organize that way. And this is, this is what's called subjective validation. And um, this is what uh, how Marx and Kamen and, and David Marx later in the book I told you about, uh, this is what they attribute to why uh, people like Targ and so on were so impressed with Price and that some of their remote viewers because they were able to focus on uh, the hits and sort of just overlook the, the misses and they become sort of background noise and eventually they, they, go, they leave the picture. It's called cherry picking and steroids, I guess. But anyway, uh, it's more complicated than that and uh, we're going to go into that in a, in a later lecture. I think by lecture seven and eight, we're going to get into that, and we'll have you actually have you to teach you more than that, and you know more than you'll be able to do better than this. But it's a little bit more than that. It's a little more complicated in the sense that uh, yes, that's part of the story, but only part of the story. Okay? okay. There's more to it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, can we just assume that these uh, questions that were asked in the cider uh, event? that they were just like maybe openers to get a feel for the people and their response, or was that the all of the reading? This is all the reading because he wanted to control it. He just had it. She wouldn't, in her ordinary simple. reading, in ordinary reading, she is actually going to have interaction with them. That's very important. I spent uh, years being, uh, from age 16 to I became a psychology major in, in my junior year. So from 16 to where, where I was when I was a junior in college, I was reading poems professionally. I, I did that in terms of also being a professional mind reader, a mentalist, um, and because that, that paid money. That's how I got my money. And, uh, and I, did, I had to keep adding things to my, I, I, was, I did a memory act, I did a uh, hypnotic act, all because I was a student all the time and I, had, I couldn't travel too much. So I had the same audiences year after year, so I had to develop something new for each audience. And I began developing new things, and one a couple of summers I worked in the carnival, and there was a mid camp there. And there also, people in the carnival were very, were very nice to me. They, the sword swallower would have been happy to teach me sword swallowing. The guy who climbed the ladder of swords with his bare feet was willing to teach me that. But it's very dangerous, you know, if you just, it's okay, you can do it, as long as you never, don't ever slide your foot, even the slightest amount, then it slices right through. Uh, so you can do these things, you can walk on glass and bare feet. No problem, but as long as you know what to do, you yelled, but you make one slip and it could be it's very dangerous. So I had no intention of doing any of that. I was looking for something new, but I saw the lady in the mid camp, as they call it. That's the, the, the lady who reads palms. And that seemed a very safe thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't go to anyone to, get, to learn anything. I just went to the library and took out some books on palmistry. And the first thing I learned is that each palmistry book contradicts the other. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I did learn palmistry pretty well, and that's how I began doing it. And uh, I did it for a number of years, and I didn't say, I, I probably did, was, a, was pretty good, came to believe it, because I knew all about the generalities, I knew about everything you said about these kinds of statements here. And if you read palmistry books, they can get very specific. You, you, you uh, can age, uh, tell what time some, someone had some problems with their head, uh, by looking at the headline, and you could tell that it this age 30, it's age 40, something like that, you can figure out. And I would tell people from that, from, from what the palmistry said, I would often tell people that I can see you had a problem with your 
head, something like that. When you were age 14, I said, yes, I fell out of a tree onto my head. How did you know that? Yeah, it's fantastic. So I was getting these, to me it seemed like I was getting too many uh, reactions to very specific things I was saying. I wasn't using these generalities and stuff like that. I wasn't saying your kidneys are normal. I was saying uh, that you had problems with your kidneys at age 42. He said, yeah, how did you know that? It was right on, you know. So I get enough of that. I don't know how often. So it convinced me something's got going on here. Also, unlike astrology and tarot cards and stuff like that, at least the lines are on your hand. So, so there was some connection to the person. Maybe there was something going on there. So I was, uh, I was pretty good uh, in the sense that I could convince people. And I was getting paid very well to do my readings. Uh, and uh, I was going this, and I was, I think I was ready to say I was pretty good. And uh, when I was, a, my first major uh, in college was as a journalism major. And again, that's another thing where uh, low stupidity gets in the way, you know, low, low thinking. I didn't even know the general, I went to a high school where only 10% of the graduating class went to college. So it wasn't normal to go to college. And when I was about to ready to go to college, I decided I, I knew I was going to go to college. I, I knew that was something I should do, even though no one else was going to college, none of my friends. And um, so uh, when it was time to graduate, uh, getting ready for the time to graduate, I went around and I found we had a vocational counselor. And I did understand the word vocational. So I went to see him. And it turned out, afterwards I now know, he had been a uh, high school uh, track coach or something like that, and he was an alcoholic, and they couldn't know what to do with him, and so they made him a vocational counselor. What else can you do with a guy like that? Um, so he's a vocational counselor. I went to him. He gave me what I now know is a coup de preference test. And that's a test where you fill it out, and they match you, your answers to how well it matches people in different professions. And so he called me and after I took the test and he said, he looked at it and I thought this is all magic, you know, this is something, uh, this is a, 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 a test, you know, a very professional thing and something like that. And he said, this says that you should be a journalist. I didn't even know what a journalist is at that time. Uh, but I knew I had to be a journalist because that's what the test said. And he <laughs> said it. And uh, I now know, ret in retrospect, I know I was a lot, a lot of hogwash, but uh, <laughs> and he said that, and then he said the nearest college is Boston University. So I went to Boston University, and in my first two years I was a journalist major, and um, uh, the head of the psychology department at Boston University then, his name was Willem Pinard, he was from South America, a very colorful guy, uh, called me and he, uh, he, I got a note saying that Mr. Professor Pinard at the psychology department wants to see you. I knew, this is amazing to me, this guy wants to see me? So I went there and he ushered me into his office and he said, he gave me a real bawling out. He said, don't you know this is fraud that you taking money from people on false pretenses? I heard you going around reading people's palms and charging them for it. This is completely hogwash. And I let him talk and talk because I wasn't bothered by it. I knew it was more than hogwash because I was getting people giving me all these saying, saying validating me, right? And uh, so I just sat there and he paused for a while, and I said, can I see your palm? <laughs> so, I gave, so he gave me his palm, and I gave him a reading, and, then, and he, I left. Two weeks later, I got a note saying, Professor uh, Pernod wants to see you again. <laughs> so I went, he shouted me into his office, he shut the door, he put his palms out, and he says, can you tell me more? <laughs> <laughs> I was the head of the psychology department, which I later became a, 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 a major in, uh, and I, the reason I decided to major in, my, my most important reason was I had a friend who was, the, at that time, one of the, the best, uh, he still is in my mind, the best mentalist of ever, of all time. And he, he called himself Dr. Stanley Jacks. He was from Switzerland originally, actually from Germany, but he said he was from Switzerland, it sounded better at that time. And um, he uh, always time when I, we came to Boston, uh, his agent, by the way, was the same agent handled Eleanor Roosevelt. When he came, he worked mostly for private clubs and, and private organizations. Uh, when he came to Boston to do a show, he, call, he would call me and we'd get together. And he loved to, if, if I was doing readings at the time, he loved to come and watch. He couldn't watch my readings, but he would sit outside my booth. I have a booth with the curtains around it. And, uh, and usually I was working for psychic, uh, for, for uh, uh, charity bazaars and stuff like that. They have several booths, other things going on. And um, he would sit outside, 
And in between readings, he would discuss it with me. He was very fascinated by it. And one time he said to me, Ray, and I, no one else, I don't think I would listen to him. He said, Ray, he said, just as an interesting experiment, the next person comes into your booth, if the line says that they, that they, that they are rational, uh, v logical, say that they're uh, intuitive. So if, they, if it says that they are, um, like to show their emotions, say they don't like to show their emotions. Just staring backwards, to see what would happen. Well, the next lady came in, and she, uh, I was talking to her, and usually I get a lot of feedback. And this is something I realized later also. When I'm reading, telling people what they want to hear, they're pushing their hands towards me suddenly. When I'm telling things, it's amazing how much you get, you know. And I now know more about it than, than I did then, even. Uh, and when I'm telling something they don't want to hear, they're, they're, they're pulling their hands back. They're almost like they're forming the reading with their hands. Uh, it's, and so, as I was reading this, uh, lady, she was absolutely not moving at all. It's weird. It's like talking to someone on the phone and they never say anything, you know? She was no, no feedback at all. She wasn't, and it was horrible. I kept going, and I was I do, saying everything wrong, and I said, oh boy, I was I furious. I was thinking that. When I get to the end, I'm going to really ball him out. You know, he, he followed this whole thing up for me, and I took the seriousness of it. I'm making, I'm giving this lady everything wrong, and I'm following the whole thing up. Well, it turned out, that she was so rigid and, and so suffering yeah, because she was absolutely amazed and she was shocked because she said she had been to several readers, she'd been to table readers, she'd been to everyone, and this is the most insightful, <laughs> most striking <laughs> reading you ever had. <laughs> and that was a that was a that was a wake up call to me. I tried it a few more times, and, and I, it dawned on me, it does make sense which, which way I'm going. I, if I could read the lines this way or that way, whatever's going on had nothing to do with the lines in their hand. And at that point, I decided I'm going to change my major from journalism to psychology, so I, I can learn why I and other people taken in by it. What I subsequently learned was that, unfortunately, my colleagues in psychology are actually more gullible than the, than the people outside, because they believe in something called the Rorschach test, and they had the other things. I could tell, I've been statisticians too, I knew, looking at the data and the experiments, that there was no validity to these, to the Rorschach and stuff like that. But yet, even today, I, but the psychologists then, everyone in, uh, who got their degree in clinical psychology had to spend half a year at least mastering the Rorschach, and then, uh, then they also had to spend time learning some other projective techniques. And none of these projective techniques, I could tell, had any validity whatsoever. Palmistry was had more had more validity because no one at least studied it to show it was wrong. But there have been studies to show that they, that this doesn't work. Yet psychologists who find them to still today believe in such crazy things as they even believe in these personality tests, which which actually are not very valid. It's very hard to find a, make a personality test that has any validity whatsoever. They have so little bit, but but the projective tests have none. And yet you had a whole group of people calling themselves psychologists, and they supposedly get some statistical training and experimental training as well. They supposedly should know things like I'm teaching you here, yet they all believed completely. And the, the reason they believed because they had stories to tell. They had talked to a patient and, and, and said, I can see that because of all this that you have um, uh, this kind of a problem and this kind of thing and stuff like that. And the patient said, yeah, just like my people when I read, read the poems. And so they had val that kind of validation, and so it didn't make a difference what the statistical tests were showing, what the experimental literature showed. It, 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 these, these, they had no doubts that these were real. Any other questions? I, yes? I want to kind of go to you as a palm reader. Um, you said very uh, kind of roundabout that you really believe your own... It's hard theory. to know what I really believe. You know, I was still a skeptic all during that time, but I thought there might be something to this because of the lines in the hand and stuff like that. And I also was aware because that I wasn't telling the general statements, you know, like I was telling them very specific things. But now I know I was getting feedback from them. I know consciously when I do it now, I'm looking for it. I'm getting, I'm, I can see that what they're guiding my, they're guiding the reading as much as I am. And that's why I, I point out in my manuals on cold reading, when I do workshops on cold reading, I, I realize that when you're doing your reading right, you're, 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 the person you're reading is like a collab is collaborating with you. And it's like I am the ghostwriter who writes the book uh, that, that the, the celebrity's book is written, always written by a ghostwriter. But they're collaborating. The, uh, the uh, celebrity feeds all this information into the 
uh, to the ghost to the writer, and the writer organizes it, we puts it, repackages it, and puts it out as a coherent story. And that's what a psychic reader does. In fact, I wrote a whole paper on this one time. It's in my book on uh, 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 Lucifer Quarry. Yeah, I think it's reprinted there. It's, and I, 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 the whole theme of that paper was the psychic reader as a um, as a ghost writer, basically. And uh, and it's a good analogy because that's actually what's going on. It's a collaboration. Uh, the reader is getting, you're giving me, feeding me stuff, and you're collaborating with me. You're feeding me stuff, and I'm, I'm repackaging it and feeding it back to you. Right. And we're both happy because I get the money, and you get the, you get the your four minutes of fame, and uh, everyone's happy. So, so it's a win-win situation. Well, one of the things Not for science, but for rationality, but it's a win-win situation right. for individual people. Um, sure. um, one, of the, one of the things the skeptics have a lot of trouble with, and I'm just... I'm really moved by in hearing you talk about it is skeptics I think have a lot of trouble understanding that charlatans aren't charlatans uh, for um, uh, for malignant sake. They, they, they are, like you're describing yourself, they're people who fell for something and are perpetrating. Okay, now, now what you're bringing up, uh, the, the question here, it brings up another issue, uh, and that is that uh, most of the, the people in the trade who are cold readers, by the cold reading is usually used for people who are consciously, self-consciously know what they're doing. Okay. They know that, they are, that this is a fake and they're, and they're, they're manipulating people. 90% probably, I don't know, this is a rough guess, 90% of the people who are out there doing readings, they're what are called shut eyes by the other people in the trade. Shut eyes are people who, who believe in themselves, you know. They just shut their, they, I guess the term comes around, they just shut their eyes and just say whatever comes out. So most of the people out there are people who really believe in what they're doing. They have somebody, there's a mixture, there's a strange mixture of people who have to believe what they're doing, but they also take advantage of any, any information they can get otherwise elsewhere. So there's, it's a mixture. And um, then I know people who began out there as pure skeptics doing this. Uh, in fact, there's a book by Mark Edward out. He was spent his whole life doing stuff like that, and he just got a book out recently. And he's playing it both ways. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, he says he doesn't claim he's a psychic, but he's not going to deny it. I called him out on it. What's that? I called him out on it. Well, so did, so did James Swiss. So he's a, com he's, a com he's a good friend of Randy. Randy wrote the yep. introduction to it. So it's a, these, are, these are questions. These are interesting questions. And he go back and forth that way. Uh, and, um, and I, as part of that, I was in the middle of all that too. I was both a mind reader, and I, I you know, it, it, I was until I went to graduate school. Uh, so I was for six years roughly. I was doing, presenting myself. I don't like to do mental demonstrations. I'm, I'm a magician. I prefer to do card stuff and that kind of stuff. But people would pay me much, much more to apparently stand up here and read your mind, and predict the future and those stuff like that. So I, to make more money. Uh, per thing, and it did. It pays much more money. People are more willing to watch you because it's much more believable, and they want to believe in the ESP. Uh, I was doing a mind reading type of demonstration, like mentalism, but I never claimed to be real. What I did was I came out, and this is always a problem. I'm a mentalist. I used to belong to the Psychic Entertainers Association, and they're always fighting among themselves as to how you should use a disclaimer. A disclaimer means you say, you tell people, you don't want them to go away, supposedly, believing that what you did is real. On the other hand, if they don't believe it's real, they're not going to, who's going to sit for hours watching the same thing over and over again if you're reading minds? Once you've read one mind, you've done it, right? Um, but anyway, so it's a big problem, and they fight about it among themselves. It's a big fight even within the, the Skeptics Association, because there are people like Mark Edwards, who's very active uh, with the IEG, with the yeah. Yeah, investigating committee, and he's a very active skeptic. And his uh, girlfriend, uh, Susan Skirbik, uh, Gerbic, is doing a fantastic job of, of mastering the uh, Wikipedia and knowing how to go back and take articles on Sylvia Brown, who says she was a psychic. They now say she's an alleged psychic. They also give her, in her, the article on Sylvia Brown, there's her whole history of being incarcerated for uh, using her fortune telling to get people invested in the fake stock schemes and that kind of stuff. Uh, she, she's doing a great job that way. So he's working with her too, at, at doing very active stuff, being uh, helpful on, the, on that side. At the same time, he makes his living uh, being uh, 
now mostly for celebrity parties. He goes, uh, celebrities like um, uh, famous Hollywood people, mm -hmm. they hire him to come to their house and have a party where he does psychic readings. He gives everyone a psychic reading. And um, he does not claim to be a psychic. Does not claim to be a psychic, he says that. But on the other hand, he doesn't say he's not a psychic. And that creates the problem. Uh, he says, he calls himself a performance artist, and as a performance artist, you're doing something, and if he came out and said, look, I'm gonna give you a reading, but uh, this is all fake. It takes away from the value of the reading for the person, something like that. Uh, so it's a very difficult problem to have. I was, remember, I wasn't, didn't, was on, didn't know about all these subtleties and stuff like that. I started when I was 16 to do professional mind reading, uh, mentalism, but I was young looking much younger than looking than I am now, actually. <laughs> I even looked younger, to believe, if you could believe it. So I looked much young, young for my age. And so I, would, I could be, there was a man named Dunninger who was a, a, a very, he, his mind reading type of thing, he was on television and then, uh, radio then on television. He would, he was a big imposing figure and he was very powerful and he would come to you and say, now you're thinking of Joe Graggioli. Isn't that right? And you didn't dare say no. no. <laughs> but I, was, I didn't have that. I was a little kid and I, I knew I was going to get away with that. So I would come out right away and simply say, uh, in fact, if you look on the YouTube, you see an interview with Mark Edward interviewing me about this because he wanted to get justification for his position. But I did this before I was uh, knew better. So I would come out and say, look, I don't make any claims for what I do. I hope, I study hard for what I do, and I hope you enjoy it, but I don't make any claims at all. And then I would just do the show, not, not say anything else. I quickly learned that as a result of doing this, I did two things. One, I diffused uh, the situation in the sense that they had no basis for challenging me because I made no claims. Right up front of the front, I said I don't make any claims. So they, so they were relaxed in one sense, but I also was encouraging what I know as, now know as a psychologist, what we call the invited inference. Uh, that is, if you want to conv convince people that you have an ordinary deck of cards as a magician, for example, uh, uh, this, you know an amateur magician, a new magician, because they, they, they would come out and say, look, I have an ordinary deck of cards. Now, why shouldn't a deck be ordinary? So you're calling attention to it, and you're re re lifting yourself up, and if, you, if your deck really isn't ordinary, you're in trouble, because people are going to grab that deck, they want to examine it, because you raise that question in their head, which was no need to have that question in their head. Uh, a professional magician, if he has a special deck of cards, happen to have the, the last thing he wants to do is mention, call attention to the fact that it's ordinary, because why shouldn't it be? He would just handle it like it's ordinary, and then you've got no places for challenging him on it. And, and this is, this is, this is making, because if the people make the inference themselves that it's an ordinary deck of cards, then it's a very powerful situation. So what I was doing, I was inviting the inference that I was real. They had no basis for challenging me otherwise, and I just did my show. At the end, as far as I know, everyone believed I was for real. And I knew this because even at age 16, when I finished my show, I used to be embarrassed by that. My ears would go red. Women would come up after me. Everyone wanted to be private readings. And a lot of people do their shows, and they end, end up giving private readings. I never did that, but I knew I could have made a lot of money. People would come up to me afterwards. They, wanted me to, they would tell me that they were having an affair, and uh, they didn't want to tell her husband. Should they tell her husband or, or not? And I. Who me to know? Because I could told her what her telephone number was. How I could? How, how does that justify my being able to give her advice on whether she should or should not uh, tell her husband she's having an affair with with the husband's best friend or something like that? You know, and they were telling me all these things, and my ears were going red. You know, <laughs> I was getting embarrassed. And uh, but so this so even the, so the front, real part is they assumed that. Uh, from, Soon I could do something that looked like I had some powers of some sort, and I had enough powers to do all kinds of other things as well. And that was, uh, that was also an education for me as well. Any other questions? Uh, do we have any? Uh, the five minutes. Um, yes? Well, with the woman who was very tense and said that, you know, she tried yeah. other readings and they've been unsuccessful. Right. Now, you were reading the opposite of the way you normally would. That's right. And That's you realized right. it didn't matter what you said. So right. what differentiated you from the other readers that she had? Was it That's a good other? question. That's a good question. I think it was, um, this is very important. I, by that time, was very confident. I had no doubts of my powers. And 
because I had been being forced to validate over and over again. I've been doing readings now. Well, I started when I was about 16 or so doing these readings. It's about the same time I did, a little after I did began doing mentalism, because I needed some others. I figured out that's another way of getting some money. Uh, I was getting, I get, kept getting reinforced. I was used to I'm doing a lot. Once you're doing a lot, too, you get very confident in yourself. And um, so maybe I, I reflected that confidence. And uh, that's why, who knows? I don't know for sure now. I wish, but I'm guessing it was because I, by this time, was very confident. I knew what I was doing. By the way, and when I, if, if you look at my, um, uh, J. Ref, maybe is going to put out uh, a man, print the manual I, I usually give when I give cold reading workshops and stuff. Uh, I give you rules about, and one of the things I, I tell you what to do is right from the beginning, the get go, you got to gain. If you gain your confidence. You know, what's the most, more, most very important part of a good psychic reading is what you do before the reading. How you set them up. And what you do, you do things like this. You let them know subtly. You, you have some subtle ways of doing it, and I, I suggest those that I used to use. Uh, you let them know that they're coming into your, even though they've been other readers, they're coming into your special world. And they're not sure of the rules, you know the rules. So you're gonna let them know what the rules are when they're coming into your world. And you also let them know that you're, you're good. I, I've, I've never been wrong, you know, I'm, I'm perfect. And, and, and suddenly I, I had ways of telling, letting them know that if anything goes wrong, it's their fault, not mine. Yeah. And, and so, so they, are, they, they don't want you to fail because it's gonna make a show on them as well. They want you to succeed. You get that. So you put it all together, you've got a very powerful situation. Even before you can add, you get them all set up. Once you get done that, you can be a lousy reader. It's going to be impressive reading for them. So th there's things like that, which I, I think might help. And if you read my manual, or if, well, we, we'll do a little bit at, in, when we get to the next lecture or so. Do you think the fact that you knew you were giving the wrong answers may have actually, I mean, you may have been holding her hands differently? I'm not sure what I was doing. I, I was in state of shock myself because she, she wasn't, I get feedback a lot. She wasn't giving me any feedback, yeah. It seems like you might have been holding tighter too. Or something. I, I don't know. Because you were doing, yeah, but she was in, she, basically she, she told me she was absolutely shocked how this was so true. She was just amazed. It's like electricity going through her body, you know, because she never had it, such a good reading before. Uh, it, it's an interesting question. But that was a good question. Thank you for asking it because uh, that's very important. And it's all important in doing a reading if you're going to be good. See, the, uh, uh, most of those people out there that when you go into this business of being a psychic, you're competing with, most of your competitors, they're just shut eyes. They don't know about these things. You know about how to set them up. You can set them up right. You do these other things. You're going to be way ahead of them. See, they're just doing it on, just, just doing it, you know. And just doing it, you're going to succeed anyways. But doing it with knowledge, about how to set them up and how to uh, carry it through and stuff like that, you're going to be way ahead of them. You'll be a millionaire before, uh, before you know it. Uh, and uh, as long as you don't have any morals or ethics, you'll be fine. <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions? We, we've got about one and a half minutes rest, right? So then you have a one and a half minute question, yes. Define moral and ethics, not skill. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Um, have you ever come across someone whose powers of observation, not barring anything paranormal, were simply so good that it really surprised you? That, uh... Geller. What's the question? He wants to know, the question is, uh, have I ever come across anyone whose powers of observation were so good that it Surprise me, or uh, uh, um, I'm not sure. I, there are people who are good observers, and Gell, one of his most powerful things, Gell is a lousy magician. <laughs> Gell, uh, Randy, right from the get go, was bending spoons better than Gell, even though Gell introduced that whole thing to the world and, uh, and, and doing all his life, actually. Uh, but Gell doesn't have to be good at it. That's the important thing. Gell, people don't understand that. Gell is not selling spoon bending or something like that. He's selling himself, he's got charisma. When Randy bends a spoon, or I bend a spoon, uh, by the way, I think Randy once told me he bent a spoon, he, he, he visited uh, uh, Barbara Walters, and Walters sh showed him this case she has, a uh, piece of furniture uh, cabinet with a glass 
door on it, and in it were several spoons bent by Geller. And she would invite people to her dinner parties in her apartment at that time, uh, maybe, I, maybe, maybe she still does, and she would show them, introduce them to the cabinet like it was a shrine, and said, this changed my whole life, Geller bent his spoons. And I know that if Randy or I bent Barbara Walter's silverware, she would be suing us for, for ruining it. And, <laughs> and the important message I make, uh, make the reason why I make that statement is that uh, it, it, what Geller is doing is not, it does make a difference. He's right. He's told the magicians there, he says, look, you guys do all those complicated ways. You have all these wonderful ways of, um, of, of, of bending spoons and stuff like that. I do it just a simple thing, and that's enough for me. And I'm, I'm the millionaire, not you guys. And it's because he's selling a charisma. He's selling something in a way, and he's, uh, uh, he's, he can do it with utmost, he can lie with utmost sincerity, which most of us cannot do. And th this is the important thing, why Geller is Geller and succeeded and still a millionaire, and why Randy is struggling along and doing a great job and the better magicians than anything else, but Gell Randy has ethics and people are going to know he's, he's a magician, he says it outright. Geller doesn't say that, and that's the difference. And we are at the end of this lecture, right?